Welcome to Paranormal Files Into the Darkness. I am your host, Sean Wagner. Tonight we'll be talking with Patrick Burns from Haunting Evans. It'll follow the intro. Go ahead, Brendan. Tonight's going to be a little bit different uh, as uh, Liz is feeling a little bit under the weather. So we hope she feels better uh, for our next episode. But also, uh, in the meantime, uh, this show is a super chat. So please give us a thumbs up and a share on Facebook or a uh, thumbs up and share the YouTube broadcast. That would be great. Thank you. Also, if you make questions along the way, please put them in all capital letters. All right. Now it's time as we move right along on this, especially tonight. Uh, for the real introduction, he's an American photographer and paranormal investigator, best known for being the star of True TV's Haunting Evidence. He began to get media recognition, recognition after he was featured in Emmy Award-winning Turner documentary, Interact Atlanta Ghost Hounds. Uh, Patrick Burns has attended paranormal enthusiast events held at various locations across the United States. He's also a professional photographer and author of the book, the Other Side, a teen's guide to ghost hunting and the paranormal, with Marley Gibson, his wife, and Dave Schrader. Uh, and that can be purchased on Amazon. He can be reached out on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash ghostgeek. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Patrick Burns. How Hello. are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing all right. And uh, uh, thank you for coming on with us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I always one question I always ask right at the get go, um, because you'll get various answers. How, how were how were your parents in the paranormal when you were growing up? How were my parents revolving the paranormal? Were your family? Did they have a philosophy um, on it at all? Yeah. Um, well, I was the youngest of four boys. My oldest brother John, second oldest to me. Uh, second youngest, Billy, they were all about two years apart from one another. Uh, and I was six years younger than Billy. So I was the baby. I was the caboose by uh, several years. And you know, about the time I was five five years old, uh, my oldest brother was uh, in his teens and, you know, uh, two right around the bunch of days that they like to torment their little, you know, frightened. Scary. My parents tried to, you know, they said, Yeah, we're, we're having, um, my, that my grandmother had actually, uh, been seen as a ghost by the, uh, and, um, so at that point, my mom had to do a kind of, about her, her belief in the uh, paranormal and in the afterlife. And uh, it really kind of uh, my interest. I was about 10 years old at that time. All right. We seem to be having some technical difficulty, um, quite obviously, certainly. My, my, my Can you hear me okay? Yep, I hear you. All right. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Go ahead. What did you say? Yeah, I said... Um, uh, am I coming through okay? Are you? Am I breaking up? Um, the the audio it's it's buffering just a little bit. Okay, if need be, I can move to a location where we'll get a better better signal. Just let me know. That might be a good uh, idea because um, all right. the, I, the the question I asked the response I, I couldn't tell much of a few words that you said unfortunately. Okay. Oh boy. Okay. Well, let me get. Here I'm. I'm on a. I'm on a uh, quote unquote wonderful 5G connection right now, um, okay. which obviously isn't working that great. But 
I'm actually in uh, downtown Savannah right now, very close to where I start my tour from. And uh, okay. I got my own watering hole right over here. Okay. Well, yeah, let me, get, let me get right it. there. Okay. Okay. Actually, let me get a little bit closer to the Wi-Fi. Okay. There's a Wi-Fi connection that I can get on, but you're, it's fading in and out. I don't trust the 5G on my, my with my carrier. <laughs> but I'm going to walk over close to uh, my watering hole, McDonough's Pub. And they have good, decent Wi-Fi over there. Let's see if we can't get a connection over there. Always good to hit a watering hole. Indeed. But, uh, yeah, this is beautiful Savannah I'm walking through right now. This is my uh, office, as I like to say. And let's That's see. Beautiful. It is indeed. Let's see if I can't get a connection here on McDonough's Wi-Fi. All right. There we go. Let's try and connect here. Let's see if it'll let me in. All right. Doing our best here. Oh, no problem. All right. My connection okay for right now? Yeah, it looks it looks good now. Right now, yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, we'll just I'll stick stick close here to, to um my uh my bar, my favorite establishment, McDonough's. <laughs> get a little plug in for them there. Uh, this is where I usually come after my uh, after my tours every night uh, to have a uh, have a nightcap before I head on home. So yeah, you were asking me about my uh, about my mom's uh, or about my parents' attitude of paranormal growing up. What was the last part that you were able to allegedly make out? Well, not really much of any of it. Okay, um, let me let me start over again. Okay, yeah, sorry about so that. So I I was the youngest of four boys. My brother John, Jimmy, and Billy were them were all two years apart. So by the time I was uh, five, six, you know, years old, they were already in their. Uh, they loved to torment me. They, they loved to torment their little baby brother and scare him about ghosts and hauntings. And my parents tried to reassure me that there was no such thing as ghosts, and that's kind of how it was for me growing up until. Uh, my grandmother's ghost was allegedly seen by the woman. And uh, that, I had to do a, my mom had to do a 180 degree turn at that point. Everything that she thought she knew about the paranormal, about ghosts and hauntings, uh, the woman accurately described my, my grandmother, the clothing she was wearing. And uh, my mom kind of did a 180 degree turn at that point. And uh, of course, me being the young, impressionable uh, child I am, Right. I was fascinated by ghosts, scared of them. Yes. But, uh, you know, wow. OK. Apparently my own gr grandmother has been seen as, as a ghost. That to me was pretty cool. And that kind of uh, piqued my interest in it at a very early age. I, I would think so. And I would agree if uh, your grandmother was seen as a ghost, that would be pretty cool, especially when you're very little. Yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting for me, for sure. But what 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 you guys started? Is that what got you started in the paranormal? Was there something else? No, 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 no. I uh, I got started in the paranormal uh, when I was 16 years old. I was kind of thrust into it unexpectedly. Um, when I was 16, my brother Billy, he was 22 years old uh, that summer, and he died in a horrible automobile accident, taken from us in a moment, and it devastated me. I had never experienced death firsthand up until that point, and my brother was there one moment, he was gone the next, and it really kind of um, was a devastating experience to me. Uh, uh, you know, to suddenly have this thrown in my lap, it was like a, a truckload of bricks had been dumped on me emotionally. I didn't know how to process it. But while we were mourning Billy's death, I started to wonder, is the spirit world real? Can you substantiate these things? Can you, can you uh, document them in some way? Can you study them scientifically? And that's kind of what propelled me into the paranormal. I was looking for uh, evidence of the afterlife and... Uh, uh, that's what got me started when I was 16 years old and brought me to where I am today. That sounds great. That's one thing I like about you. You are into uh, gathering proof and using equipment to do that. That's that's kind of like my thing. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yep. I, um, I'm spiritual by nature, not religious. I'm spiritual. Um, try not to put a, a, a label on it or uh, assign a, a, an image of it. I'm I'm more spiritual. I definitely believe in a higher power. Um, exactly what that higher power is, is, of course, the subject of endless debate. But I definitely believe there's a higher power. There's something beyond the three-dimensional world that we live in. I think the spirit world is a higher dimension. 
And um, you know, it, that's why we can't really substantiate it scientifically because it just doesn't adhere to our three-dimensional world we live in. Definitely. Um, you, you've been doing it for a few years. Any advice for someone starting out by chance? For anyone who might be watching starting advice out? Advice to somebody starting out for chance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, don't watch the TV shows. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody who was on a TV show, don't watch TV shows. No, don't, don't, don't learn from uh, the TV shows out there. It, understand and realize that the TV shows are for entertainment purposes. You can get some ideas about how to go about investigating, but, you know, don't necessarily believe everything that you see on TV. You know, keep in mind that the TV shows exist. They are entertainment. They're not a scientific study. And um, you know, my advice is to be skeptical. Don't, don't look at the word skeptic like it's a four-letter word or a derogatory term. In order to be an effective investigator, you have to instill a healthy dose of skepticism because not everything is a ghost. You know, so many people, so many of my contemporaries are so eager to find evidence of the paranormal that they, you know, they don't do their due diligence. They don't try to understand what causes an orb to form in a photograph. What, uh, you know, what different things uh, can happen, different uh, fields, electrical fields that can affect electromagnetic detectors. You know, here in Savannah, where I run ghost tours, there's some tours out there that hand out uh, EMF detectors, K2 meters, to their tour participants. And then they all like get so freaked out and giddy and happy when they all of a sudden get a big spike on their EMF detector. And I look above them and they're standing there underneath a phone pole transformer. <laughs> it's like, I think I found your ghost. It's up there. You know, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't understand this. Um, you know, the K2 meter, yes, I'm not, I'm not going to say that you cannot use it for uh, detecting spiritual activity, but the primary uses of an EM EMF detector is to sweep the location where you're at. Make sure that there are no hidden electromagnetic fields um, in that location because uh, there's research that suggests high EMF levels can uh, contribute to hallucinations in the brain. And, um, you know, so the first thing with an EMF detector is to go in there and sweep and identify the locations where you might have strong EMF uh, sources, such as a, a refrigerator or a freezer, uh, an air conditioner. All these things are high inductive loads. They put out a lot of EMF when they kick on and they can, they can cause you to get a spike like that. Um, your cell phone. Your cell phone is a huge source of EMF, right? If, you're, if your phone is trying to ping the server to, to check your emails, it's going to put out a signal. You'll detect that. You can watch it. It's So understanding your equipment, understanding how it works, understanding how you might get a false positive, that is crucial. That would be my first advice to anybody getting started out in the paranormal. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. We once pulled a prank on people on a tour in Gettysburg because yeah. Gettysburg is only about an hour and a half from me. And, yeah. uh, and, I, and I used to live closer. We were at one of the major uh, haunted attractions, the, uh, a, a covered bridge in Gettysburg, yeah. and sure. uh, there was a tour like there. We played with two-way radios, and the K2s <laughs> were lighting up, and they were going, oh, oh, oh. They were, like, reacting. Yeah. And uh, uh -huh. then we eventually told them, the tour guy said, oh, yeah, you're getting activity. We eventually told him, I'm sorry, we're just playing. And we showed him. Yeah, we're, we're playing, playing with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's uh, – it, it's it's tricky in that in that respect. There's a lot of people, especially people new to the paranormal, that are so eager to find evidence of the paranormal that they are willing to kind of look the other way. They're they're not they're not going to in, instill the uh, critical uh, you know uh, critical observations, the scientific method when they are being presented with uh, what's supposedly paranormal evidence. You have to understand your equipment and have to realize that you can get a false positive. I do apologize about the uh, the sound levels over here. I'm actually sitting out on the street, and there are cars and stuff that are pulling up here. Um, so let me know if the audio gets too bad if you can't hear me. It sounds perfectly fine. Uh, Good. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with you on uh, trying to be scientific and being skeptical. I couldn't yeah. agree more. You have an unusual go-to piece of equipment as well. Uh can you, you use like a uh, old blue blackberry i believe you said yeah area. yeah <laughs> <laughs> so I, i've got an old old model blackberry phone it was what actually was my phone about 12 years ago 
12, 13 years ago. It was a, it was a, a late model BlackBerry um, phone that came out um, in the uh, late 2000s. I actually used the phone. I found out about it uh, in terms of being used for uh, EVP recording purely by accident. I was at a Honda location out in California. I was uh, attending a conference out there. And um, we got a new location, and I didn't have any of my equipment with me. And I, I wanted to do an EV, uh, EMF uh, or EVP uh, session, EVP recording. And the only thing I had with me was my BlackBerry. And I was like, yeah, I think my BlackBerry has kind of a crappy-sounding voice recorder app built into it. And it did. And I decided to just try it out. I did a quick 30-second test with it, played it back, and lo and behold, I had a, res I had a response on it. I was like, cool. All right, let's do another one. Another short EVP burst, another, another response. Another EVP session, another response. And I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> what is going on here? And this, this became my go-to advice. I wasn't sure what it was about the, the particular model of BlackBerry that it um it was um it was conducive for doing EVP recordings. Uh, I actually upgraded that phone to the next model after that, and it did not get the same results. So there was either something with the software, the electronics, or the microphone on the phone itself that seemed to be working, and we were getting better results using this device. So you know, even though it is it is obsolete. Um, and it has been for many, many years. Uh, I still have a few of them. I purchased a couple of used models off of eBay, even though I can't use it as a phone. Or I just I turn the radio off on it. It is just a glorified voice recorder because it works for me. You know, and that that as EVP researcher, that is half the battle is trying to find that recorder that is, um, you know, that works for you. Everybody has their own favorite recorder that they work with. And the uh, BlackBerry uh, just happens to be mine. Definitely. I use some Sony's. Yeah, I definitely yeah. agree with you. I use uh, something I can listen to as I'm recording uh, from through Sony. Um, but also, why don't you, um, what was it like? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the TV show? Because we didn't really go too much in there on Haunting Evidence and how yeah. the people you worked with and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So Haunting Evidence was a little bit different take on the paranormal. Um, I was the, uh, I was, of course, the paranormal investigator. I was the geek behind the uh, equipment, behind the um you know, doing EVPs, doing photographs, basically trying to collect uh, evidence. And then I worked alongside a team of two psychics. And we went and we investigated cold cases. We went to crime scenes where somebody had been murdered or the last location where they had been seen before they died. And the psychics would go there, try to come up with their interpretations, their feelings, their visions of what they think happened, try and visualize as much they could you know, going back in time and trying to help figure out what actually happened in that situation. And I was the guy that was sitting behind the computer console looking for a spike in the EMF, looking for a drop in the temperature. Um, and, uh, yeah, we ran for three seasons. Uh, was initially it premiered on Court TV. Court TV was bought out by uh, Time Warner and it became True TV, I think, back in 2007 about when when the switch took place and uh we actually were one of the few shows that survived the transition from core tv to true tv and we were on for at least another uh, another season uh canceled us in 2008 and or did not re i shouldn't say canceled us they didn't renew us for a fourth season um and uh yeah it was uh it was on for uh for three seasons and uh occasionally they would run reruns of it um but uh, you know, you can check you can check out a few episodes that are still on YouTube uh, if you want to go and check. If you want to go and check it out, I certainly did. I can test. I found some on YouTube. Oh, good, 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 good. And good. another one involved two women who appeared in Dothan, Alabama. JB yeah. was the first initials. J JB Hollett one. and uh, Tracy Tracy Hollett and JB Beasley. I think were the uh, names. Thank you. I couldn't thank remember their names exactly. Beyond yeah, that. yeah, that was tragic. That was very, very, very sad. Um, it's actually not too far away from uh, the area in so southeast Alabama where my wife grew up, but that was a that was a, a tragic, bizarre, bizarre uh, st uh, tale about what happened there. I mean, they're all tragic. Every every episode 
we dealt with. These these were not happy stories. They were tragedies. Um, and in many instances, the survivors were still alive. You know, family members just looking for closure, looking for answers. And the authorities had come to a, a brick wall. They didn't know where to go with these these cases. They weren't moving forward. They were cold cases. They were still open cases, but um, basically, you know, file, uh, they had done all they could do. And they were simply waiting for, um, you know, other evidence to come forward. And that was kind of the impetus of the show was to try and give the authorities some other information to go off of to get them back on track. You know, maybe maybe the psychics don't solve the, the, the case per se, but when they're visualizing what happened, maybe they see or they describe somebody to them who, resemb who resembles a, a person of interest to them. You know, maybe it's uh, maybe it's somebody that they uh, they initially had as a person of interest, and then they kind of dismissed them as the investigation went on further. And maybe one of the psychics says, "This is the this is the profile of the person I'm I see responsible for this." And the authorities might look at it and say, "You know, that actually sounds a lot like so and so who we dismissed dismissed initially. Maybe we need to go back and take a closer look at these people." And ultimately, maybe that's what they do. And maybe they find something that they missed the first time around. Or somebody sees the coast, the cases, we're profiling it on national TV and decides to step forward and, uh, and contact the authorities like they did so many times with the TV shows Unsolved Mysteries. And that was kind of the whole premise of the TV show, a very, very different take on, uh, on the paranormal. It wasn't really a ghost hunting show. It was a, uh, a show trying to resolve cold cases and uh, help the authorities. Any idea if you actually were able to help them solve any cases? There were a couple of cases that were closed ultimately. Um, one of them involved a, a girl by the name of Katie Sepich. Katie Sepich um, was a uh, was a co-ed in college in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And Katie was raped and murdered uh, walking home from a party one night. And it was a cold case. You know, they, they didn't know where to go with it. Um, Katie's, Katie's, uh, case, Katie Sepich, uh, your viewers can Google this. Her parents were instrumental in having something passed in New Mexico known as Katie's law. And Katie's law stipulates that if you are arrested for a violent felony, one of the things they do when they're booking you, they take a DNA swab. They take a DNA swab of yours that goes in, into a database. And then they start to, um, uh, you know, they, it takes a lot of time because the DNA strand is, is of course, very, very large, but they will go into a database where they crunch numbers and they will compare your DNA sample against DNA that has been recovered from crime scenes. And it turns out that they found a match with this guy. I can't even remember his name. Uh, not even worth remembering his name. He, uh, he was picked up for, uh, I think, uh, Grand Theft Auto. He was in uh, prison serving a sentence for auto theft. And while he was incarcerated, they came up with a match on the DNA. And apparently they confronted him with this. And he said, oh, you know, yeah, uh, I met her that night. Uh, we had consensual sex, but I dropped her off at her house. And I don't know what happened to her after that. She must have been attacked by somebody else. <laughs> well, Don Oliver, one of our psychics on the show, said... Um, He saw something in the guy's truck. Even before they had a suspect, he described this guy as driving a small white pickup truck and uh, seeing it at various locations that we visited. Kept seeing this white pickup truck. And he said, there's something Katie's still in that truck. Through that truck with a fine tooth comb. Well, since this guy was incarcerated, I think his, his truck had been sold or given to a friend. Somebody else had possession of it, had the title. And the authorities did indeed. They approached them and they said, we need to investigate. We need, we need to search the car because this is a, a, a you know, suspected. It, it's part of a crime investigation. And then new owners said, sure, by, by all means, absolutely go ahead. And when they went back and they took a closer look inside the truck, Behind the seat in the cab, they found a girl, a woman's ring. 
Katie's family confirmed that it was, their, her parents confirmed that it was a ring that they had given to her as a gift. So now they go back and they confront this guy and say, if it was consensual sex and you just dropped her off, why do you have her ring in her vehicle? And at that point, apparently this guy started singing like a bird. He, he, he broke down at that point when he was confronted with that. He, he knew he had no good answer or explanation for why he should have her ring. And he apparently started to sing like a bird at that point and, um, and confessed to everything. And, uh, you know, so it's, um, I think it's interesting in that, yes, the case was solved using good old fashioned police work, DNA, right? But also the fact that John J. Oliver said, take a closer look at this guy's car. Go back and search it again. I'm certain there's there's something in there of, of hers still in that car. And indeed they did, and they found it, and uh, that helped to close the case. That is really an impressive um, uh, thing that he picked up or whatever he did to get a hold of it to yeah. – uh, or whatever allowed him to pick up on that piece of – on that idea, period. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, John's a pretty interesting individual. Do you still keep in touch with either one by chance? Um, the, uh, I, I speak with John occasionally from time to time. Another uh, person was on the show with me, but I do speak from time to time still with John J. Oliver. He and I contact one, once another, uh, if he happens to be in town or I'm in town, uh, we've, we've done uh, lunch before since the TV show ceased production and very, very down to earth, very humble individual and not really a career psychic. If you understand what I mean, he's, uh, he's more into, uh, doing martial arts, Taekwondo. Uh, I think he owns a couple of bookstores, so he has his hands full beyond, um, you know, working, uh, do, doing police work. But one of the things I really admired about John was that he does not immerse himself in a criminal investigation unless he is asked by law enforcement. A lot of psychics get out there. I won't mention names, but a lot of psychics get out there. And they immediately jump right into the investigation without being asked to do so by authorities. Um, even when the authorities don't want anything from them, they don't give them any tangible information that they can work off of. And they say, thank you, but no, thanks, but no thanks. This really doesn't, isn't helping us out any. Some of them still insist that they have to go further and further into it. And they have to, um, you know, they immerse themselves in it. John, on the other hand, uh, always told me, he said, I never work a, a, a crime investigation unless I am invited by the authorities, by the police to do so. And he said, there's a couple of reasons for this. He said, number one, um, if you immerse yourself, you can be charged with obstructing the police, uh, obstructing an, a criminal investigation, which of course is a crime. Whereas if he is asked by the authorities to get involved, if he's asked to get involved, at that point he becomes a special, uh, special investigator. He's basically working for the police, you know, not for not for hire, but offering his services because the police have asked for his services. He said, number two, the other problem is, what if the family hires the psychic to go and investigate the, the, the death or the disappearance of their child? And what if the psychic picks up on the fact that I think the father, the husband in this case, might be the guilty party? Now, if you've been hired by by the, uh, the the husband to go and apply your psychic abilities and try to investigate this case, it creates a very, very strange conflict of interest between you and your client when you're fingering their, your client as the possible perp that did it. That so, would be um, as a serious problem as a psychic, yes. When yeah. he's working with a police officer, he can go interview the family and then he can walk over into the next room and say, go take a closer look at the father. And then he is completely removed from it. He doesn't have to worry about the uh, awkwardness of, uh, you know, telling the family, I think you did it, you know. And so it's very smart, very, uh, very uh, intelligent way to approach uh, working with law enforcement, only getting involved if law enforcement asks them and only getting involved if it's law enforcement that asks, not the family, not friends. That definitely sounds like the way to do it. Also, yeah. uh, just a reminder. Uh, our guest is paranormal investigator, author, and tour operator Patrick Burns from Haunting Evidence, and he's also an author of the book The Other Side, A Teen's Guide to Ghost Hunting and the Paranormal. It's available on Amazon. He also operates Savannah, or Savannah, excuse me. 
Okay. <laughs> doing like Michigan pronunciations there. Savannah Ghost That's Tours right. uh, at gotghost.net. And this show is a super chat. So please give us a thumbs up and a share on Facebook or a thumbs up, subscribe, and share the YouTube broadcast. Thank you. If you have any questions along the way, please put them in all capital letters to make it easier for Brendan to identify so we can get them over to Patrick. Also, um, Patrick, also on, on the book, um, can you tell us a little bit about your book, A Teen's Guide to Ghost Hunting and the Paranormal, which also you wrote with uh, your wife, Marley Gibson, and also uh, a prior guest, Dave Schrader, a kind words about you when he was on with us. Uh-oh, are you still there? Uh-oh. That's not good when it's just me. Uh, hopefully, he'll be back in a moment. Um, let me see for a moment. Here. Or something. There we go. Ah. You got me. <laughs> Sorry yes. about that. Hey, no problem. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your book? Uh, yeah. Your so, um, my wife, Marley Gibson, um, she's an author. And she wrote a teenage um, uh, book series about fictional book series about ghost hunters. It's called the Ghost Huntress series. I think there's five books that she put out. And she and I met while she was attending a paranormal conference back in 2008 at the Stanley Hotel. And uh, we met, we formed a, a very close friendship when we met at that event. And she had told me that she was writing a book about, about teenage ghost hunters. And I said, that's fascinating. I said, I would love the opportunity to write the foreword for your book, which I did for the first book in the series. And um, you know, the book did fairly well uh, on the charts. And when it came out, Marley's agent and Marley, they kind of hatched this idea. What if there was sort of a nonfiction companion to go with the Ghost Hunters series for teenagers that read the book and might want to try out paranormal investigating for themselves, why don't we write kind of a manual, kind of a how-to instruction guide for getting started? What to do, what not to do, um, how to apply the scientific method, that sort of thing. And uh, ultimately, that's, uh, that's what became the, the book. She and I uh, uh, co-authored it together and uh, put it out, and uh, it... Uh, it is still available. Uh, I don't. I think it's in ebook form. You can get it from Amazon. It's called "The Other Side: A Teen's Got a Ghost Hunting in the Paranormal." All right, one well, moment here. I'm trying to bring it up here. I'm having trouble for some reason. I'm not sure what I'm doing right. I didn't. Yeah. I'm doing something wrong. I'm sorry. I'm trying nope. to bring it up. Oh, there it is. Can you, are you able to see that? Okay. Yeah, that's it. Don't know if I can get up in full screen because I'm doing something wrong. I think. Um, sure. But. Uh, at least that's a, a picture, so people can tell. They can buy it on Amazon, and uh, what the book looks like picture-wise. All right, we're gonna stop sharing the screen here. All right. Cool. Thank you so much for the plug. Hey, you're welcome. Uh, I'm I'm just glad you uh, came on. You're someone who I look up to, and I appreciate the way um, I like the way you do your investigations too. And plus, uh, like right. I met you at. Um, at, in Penn State, for example. At Penn State, you, yeah, Paracon. Yeah, and you talked to us for a little bit at uh, Schwab Auditorium, and that was, to me, that was awesome. I was glad I you remember that, to yeah. Those I were good days. It was fun. <laughs> Just a few years ago as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, can you tell us about your tours as well? Yeah, so um, I'm a ghost tour guide here in Savannah, and I've been doing this for eight years. My wife, Marley, and I, we moved here back in 2014. Um, after we'd been touring the country, living out in, out of an RV for almost three years, we decided it was time to stop moving, plant some roots someplace, and we settled on Savannah, Georgia as the place to do that. Um, we were both familiar with Savannah. We'd been here several times, and of course, Savannah, being as allegedly haunted as it is, seemed like a, a natural fit for both of us. And so I came here and uh, decided to become a tour guide. And initially started working for another company, but ultimately started working uh, for ourselves. About five years ago, we started our own company called Exploration Point Tours, and our tour is called Got Ghosts. And uh, we do it uh, nightly 
we run nightly tours here in the historic district of Savannah. In fact, I am uh, about 25 minutes away from uh, starting my tour. I'm uh, very close to where I start the, start the tours from. Maybe you can kind that of see awesome. street view there of um, Savannah. Yeah, a little bit. There it is. There's the website. Good. I was having trouble. I wasn't sure if it was even up. Awesome. <laughs> That's it. Well, scroll down. You can talk. Feel free to talk about it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the par Paranormal Activity Tour was our original tour. And um, it's very different than any other ghost tours in Savannah because there are lots of ghost tours here. It's a very well-stocked pond. Visitors to the city have a plethora of choices when it comes to ghost tours to go on. And it's really, it's, um, it's, it's, it's challenged to kind of uh, stand out from everybody else when there are literally dozens of other ghost tours that are operating here. But our tour is a little bit different. When I started working as a tour guide back in 2008, I, uh, like I said, I went to work for another tour company and this company was established. They had been here for, I think, almost 20 years at that point, or, or 20 years. They had been around forever. Um, established company. Sorry, that was my alarm telling me to get ready for work. Um, established company that was here in Savannah for 20 years. And when I went to work for them, they gave me their research. And I use big air quotes when I say research because I came to learn something very quickly. Most Ghost tour most ghost tour guides in Savannah are storytellers. Okay? They're storytellers first. They might have an interest in the paranormal, but they're storytellers. And many of them are very, very good storytellers out there. There's very good storytellers. Um, I hear them every night as I pass by them. A lot of people talk with emotion and passion about the stories. They're not their stories. These are stories that are given to them by uh, the company they go to work for, just like it was for me. Most tour guides are storytellers. Well, I guess my former employer didn't really think it through when they hired a paranormal enthusiast, a paranormal investigator. I'm an investigator first. I'm a storyteller second. And as an investigator, I like to do my own research. I like to go back and uh, when I'm told a story, I like to do my own historical research dig in, find out if there's any truth to these stories, find out if, uh, you know, if these things match up. I'm sorry, I apologize. I am on the street, I got. Um, no, no problem. I started to find out that it was like the telephone game. These stories that I've been given, there was a thread of truth to them. There was a thread of truth to these stories, but they had been and taken dressed up by storytellers who wanted to tell an entertaining story. And so this, you know, this created some friction between me and my former employer. I was, you know, I was, when I was hired by them, I was told, we need to make sure that we've got all of our facts correct. We need you to go and research these stories and make sure we're getting them right. And when I went and did so, there was some blowback from their other tour guides who had been telling these stories for years. And it's like, well, I can't change my stories up now just because it's true or it isn't true. <laughs> I'm like, Certainly. I'm like, Okay, well, um, yeah, that's, that was sort of the beginning of the end for me and my former employer. Uh, five years uh, ago, Marley and I started our own company, uh, Got Ghosts, here in Savannah. And I started leading tours. And my, my tours, over the years when I was working for my former employer, sort of morphed. When I started to do my own research and I found out that the story wasn't correct, I corrected it. I went in and I revised my stories and told them this is the way it's, it's commonly rumored to have gone, but here's the actual details of what we found that we actually have historical references to back up. And so what ended up happening as I started doing my ghost tour over the years, I began to have my own paranormal experiences and encounters during the tour, not only to mis myself, but to people who are attending my tour. Sometimes people would take a, a crazy photograph and I'd be like, I need a copy of that, please. And I have a copy of that. And so over the years, I started to amass not only my own recordings, my own evidence, but evidence that other people had collected. And it morphed from being me telling somebody else's stories 
to me telling my own stories. And I'm saying, I can vouch for this, folks, because I was there. You know, I, this, this happened to me during, during my tour. Or in one instance, um, I actually met a woman who was a subject of one of the ghost stories that we've been telling on company I worked for. Actually, <laughs> you want to talk about how crazy that was. You know, most people hear ghost stories. You never expect that you're actually going to meet, let alone question, somebody who is in a ghost story, right? Usually they're old stories that have been around. The people that are in them are long gone. And this was an instance where I actually had an opportunity to briefly speak with a woman who was a subject of one of these stories. And she confirmed with me. She said, mm -mm. she said, that's not the way it happened. She clarified what did happen. Um, it was her mother that thought she experienced some activity, but her mother had advanced Alzheimer's. She was dying from dementia and not really a credible witness at that point. And this is what I began to realize. I started to realize that these are stories that have been dressed up, embellished by storytellers to try and tell a more interesting story. But there's really no reason to do that in Savannah. The, the city is so amazing. There's so much history here. There's so many things of a truly bizarre nature that have, been, that have happened here that can be documented that you don't have to go and make stuff up. And uh, it really irks me when I hear other tour guides out there on the street and they're telling stories that are not factually accurate. It, it makes me cringe. My, my spine, I feel creeping up my spine when somebody's telling a story to these visitors to the city and it's not true. And of course, you can't say anything at that point. But, you know, <laughs> to each their own, I suppose. That's definitely true. Can you tell us some of the spots you hit in your walking tour? I'm sorry? You tell us some of the spots you hit on your uh, the tour you're doing tonight? Oh, yes. Yeah. Sure. Well, one of the spots I hit is actually right over here on the street. It's uh, historic theater. Uh, I guess we can. Yeah, I guess we can't do that. It's going 2008. Out a bit. And uh, it's one of the most compelling stories that I have. I, I, I can't. Did we go out? Come a little bit closer. Is that better? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, if you could just shoot around here now? a little bit. Yeah. Sure. It's in the way here, but the historic Savannah Theater is over there, okay? And that's one of the locations I stop at on my tour. Very compelling experience that I had there back in uh, 2008 before I lived in Savannah. Um, we also stopped by the Sorrel Weed House. Um, very famous for being featured on a number of, of paranormal TV shows. Uh, the most infamous famous and infamous location that we uh, stop at is the Mercer Williams house off of Monterey Square. Mercer Williams house is the setting for the true crime novel Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. And um, it was also made into a, a major motion picture, it was directed by Clint Eastwood and filmed here in Savannah. And that's another hot spot that we hit on along on the tour. Um, and uh, we all basically take them on a, a two hour stroll through the city to various locations within about a 10 block radius and uh, tell them about the things that have happened there. Tell them about the history of that location and then the things that have actually happened to me over the years that I've experienced there. So again, like I said, it's kind of a unique take on, on ghost tours and that I, these are my own stories. These are my own experiences and encounters that and, uh, and people that have been on my tour as well. I think that's definitely the way to do it. If you can, it certainly yeah. provides different stories than everyone else. A I different take for sure. Over to your tour. Yeah. And, Nobody's uh, no, you, I tell ghost stories on my tour that you are not going to hear on any other tour in the city of Savannah. I can that, guarantee that's, you that. That's awesome. And, uh, well, we're going to have to wrap things up because how much, what time is your next tour? I have a new tour coming up in exactly 16 minutes over All there, right. uh, a block, a half a block away from where I'm at over in, uh, in Chippewa square is where I start. And, uh, my tour participants should be showing up here in the next couple of minutes. So I'm going to grab a glass of water here at McDonough's, uh, hydrate, and then head on out and uh, go explore my office, the historic district of Savannah. That is awesome. Also, um, again, our guest was paranormal investigator, author, tour operator, Patrick Burns. He can be reached at go, got ghosts, excuse me, gotghost.net. His Facebook account is facebook.com slash ghostgeek. 
Also, his book, The Other Side, A Teen's Guide to the Ghost Hunting and the Paranormal, is available on Amazon. Our next show will be July 21st with James Anito, a demonologist. August 4th, Jack Carey, a paranormal intelligence agency, where we'll be talking men in black and black-eyed children. August 18th, Shannon Rogers from A Ghost Room My Life and owner of Paranormal Explorations of America. September 1st, Kieran O'Keefe, a parapsychologist from the UK's most show Most Haunted. If you like the broadcast, consider helping us out by liking and sharing. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and watching on Facebook or giving a thumbs up, subscribing to the channel, and sharing on YouTube. Thank you. We appreciate all of you, and thank you for following us. Uh, Patrick, um, thank you for hanging. If you could just hang out for just one more moment, you can go backstage and take us out, Brendan. You've been watching Paranormal Files Into the Darkness, a Catskill Appalachian Research Collective production. For more information on this program and others like it, Remember to like, share, and subscribe to CARC Universal today. To join the conversation on our Facebook group, become a member of the Catskill Appalachian Research Collective Facebook group. CARC. Relentless.